Dave, we got another episode diving into the profession of strength and conditioning. And today we are talking ability. So when we boil it down, what is ability when it comes to coaching? Yeah, this is a important topic because one of the things that I think is so often look, overlooked in education is that actually getting on the floor. You talk a lot about this within the book, How to Become a Strength Coach. It's this idea of apprenticing in other professions that are mm -hmm. trade-based like electrician, plumbing, carpentry, that there's a, a certain learned basic skills of how to measure, how to cut, how to build your, I guess, tool belt to bring in to a work site so you have everything at your disposal ready to go so you can be as efficient as possible when you're at work. And I think that process when you're actually on the floor coaching is the ultimate indicator of your education preparation and ability. And we look at that convergence of all those things in one, can you handle a dynamic situation, right? You can make an analogy towards military. You got the tacticians and you got the people actually in combat. And there's probably a level of looking at the coaches that can get on the floor and coach are always going to be, in a sense, more valuable than the coaches that are potentially just maybe just floating and coming up with ideas on how to train. Because those are the people that can actually make the change. So that's the dynamic we really want to dive into is this idea of ability and looking at your actual skill set as a coach to facilitate your athletes getting the most from their experience. And then the final aspect would be how do we evaluate that? One of the things that I really think is important to dive into is this component of we can't just subjectively say someone's good or not. We actually have to develop some objective criteria and looking at that ability to determine whether that person's effective or not effective at their job. When we're talking about motivation, this is where it really will come out, right? Because I think everyone's curious, everyone's interested in strength conditioning, the reading books, going to courses, doing online seminars, these are all noble and they're all really important, but it's definitely a lot less invasive to actually developing yourself. And I think sometimes we can double down on the knowledge and apply our motivation to that, but it's like getting a master's degree. It's beneficial if it actually serves a specific function, but it could also serve as productive procrastination and delaying the inevitable. One of the things that I want to really address within this 30 minutes is looking at our vocation as a trade and a trade that works in the service industry, we work with people. We are in the people industry. We're developing people both physically mentally and emotionally to get them the best possible outcome. And that's human interaction based. And that's a skill that you develop. And there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of process and evaluation and looking at it from humans are complex and messy. And there's a lot of gray, not necessarily as much black and white. Defaulting to that notion and really getting into the weeds, that will be really important. And when we're thinking about ability, we also need to look at it from this other component of how am I grading or evaluating you? Which we'll talk about that through this podcast, but I think that's the most important component here is thinking about what the actual job is and then having some sort of diagnostic to really develop that and then having the motivation to actually change that. Well, let's dive into that right now then. So let's say, you know, you walk in here at Candy View, you're observing me. What are you looking for to determine whether or not I'm doing a good job coaching? Yeah, does it pass the eye test is probably the first one. I uh, do. Can I turn off the, the sound and look at what the actual input is? And one of the things that we want to address with any strength conditioning coach is it actually has to be, have the appearance of looking like an effective session, right? And sure. sometimes we develop some sort of authority bias that we are more knowledgeable or more aware of what we're doing than our counterparts in the coaching world. And sometimes this can give us some sort of elitist type syndrome. And, and truth be told is we're probably much more competent in what we're doing than our counterparts or our coaches. Just simply from the investment in continuing education, the general knowledge, the interest, the curiosity, the, the well-roundedness, right? From talking about biomechanics to physiology to psychology, there's so many avenues within the strength and conditioning that we can really improve our knowledge. But the notion that when we're actually on the floor, what does it actually look like? And that's your preparation, that's your organization, that's your personal discipline, that's your focus on what's really important and controlling the input. And I use this example quite a bit, but I've been in a situation where I've had offices that look 
directly on the gym floor and I can get a really good view of what a coach is at that point, right? And we'll talk about what the actual thing I'm going to grade you on, but from an objective type of lens, you know, we want to have three primary things in every single session, right? We want to look at it from the dynamic of, are we making some sort of improvement? And I think that's so overlooked. And this is why I'll talk about potentially other mo modalities and methodologies that don't really adhere to principles of training like progression and progressive overload or specificity, individuality, reversibility, or diminishing returns is this dynamic of if you don't have those six foundational principles within your program, it's really going to be hard to ascertain whether you're making improvement from one week to the next or one training block to the next. And if you're not making improvement, you're just kind of occupying space. The first thing you look at is what are they doing better than what they did previously? That's, That's going to be good. pretty easy, low hanging fruit to evaluate you on. And if you have nothing to substantiate what you're doing, it's going to be hard to say you're doing a good job. The next part is this accountability aspect. And one of the things that I find that someone has a presence, it's a mutual respect. This notion of athletes kind of linger in and trickle in, don't really care if they're on time. Second order of what does it actually play out during a course of a training session? And the coach's presence or authority in that situation makes a huge difference in having a productive 60 minutes or not. And a lot of times this is overlooked quite a bit because the person might have huge level of knowledge. They might say, I'm only investing in the kids I care. They might look at it from the context of, well, I did my part. They just chose not to do it. But in reality, that's a huge part of your job. And it could be, hey, I have a presence about me that's built off of preparation and consistency and mutual respect for my athletes or my clients. And they, in turn, show the reciprocity aspect with coming in on time, trying their best with every single thing that you're asking them to do, asking thoughtful questions that might want to lead to their understanding and comprehension of what they're actually doing, not necessarily challenging your authority, but you have a meritocracy, so to speak, of this is for you, this is your development, I'm just facilitating this, but in between that, I have a job to do to hold you to the accountability aspect. And I think that part is it's become taboo of, oh, you're just a disciplinarian or you're just a uh, person who focuses on authority. Uh, you're doing everything in the whistle. You're putting so much constraints in the system to say just binarily, like this is good or bad. And I think that part can easily be construed as overly controlling, maybe insecure in terms of coaching and have to put the reins in on their athletes. Showing up on time is a pretty simple rule to abide by and we're starting the session on time. If you have a loose start, athletes are probably over time going to stop showing up on time if you have variable start times. And that's you as a coach having personal discipline to start the session at the same time. And then the final aspect is what is your influence on execution? And I call this just simply what's your coaching grade. And if I'm looking at your influence on execution, this is where the grades will really come out. This demonstrate, describe, and do. Can you demo it first off, right? If you can't demo it, you're putting a lot of restrictions on the exercises and potentially your program. That is a huge limiting factor for what you can do with your athletes. And that becomes at a compromising aspect for what you ultimately should be able to think about for your athletes. And you're now not only limited by time constraint, facility constraints, staff ability or knowledge constraints, but your ability to demonstrate in front of a group. And if you can't demonstrate Olympic lifts, then therefore you can't do it negative or less than in, in certain situations, then that might be, they might not be a perfect fit, but those are all limited by your uh, either technique or aided and embedded by your technique and ability to demonstrate. The next one is the scribe. Imagine if you broke both of your legs in your wheelchair and you have to describe how to do a hand clean to your athletes, would they still execute at a high level? And there's veteran coaches that have to organically evolve to being better with description. Right, they're good at emphasizing certain portions of that lift. And I always talk about Olympic lifts as a good indicator because you're so dynamic and so fast. But in between that first, second, and third pole, you probably don't have a lot of change in terms of coaching. It's on there. You can have them go from a hang or from blocks. You can work different speeds or amplitudes, like working a muscle clean or maybe even a lighter dynamic or a heavier, just trying to work into that power position. But all being like your ability to control once that movement's initiated is small. And we have primarily three weapons we're looking to improve technique, your feet, 
your hands and your eyes. And if I'm going to have any influence on your ability to do something at a high level when we're actually going, whether it's running or snatching or cleaning or squatting or deadlifting or doing a pull-up or a bench press, I want to look at your hands, your feet, and your eyes as ability to do that. And it goes into what is your setup? What's your start? What does the warm-up sets look like? What does it actually play out with when we're getting into this? What do I actually have control over? And that's what I'm going to focus on with my description. If I'm going to describe how to do Olympic lifts, I'm going to focus on stance. I'm going to focus on the receiving position. Because those are the parts that I have the most direct influence on. And I want to yep. give them some sort of formal direction in terms of where their hands, eyes, and feet are going to be when they pull or when they catch. And that part is, is a skill in itself. And you know you're good at describing or demonstrating something based off of when you're on the floor, you don't have to say much. That's the holy grail. That's when we look at it from a coaching ability that you're so impactful when you're describing and demonstrating a workout that once they get going, it's just, there's only one way to do it. And then it gets into this final component of doing it and holding them accountable to it. We broke down the lift. We described it and demoed it. Now it's actually time to go do. And when they're actually doing it, what does it look like? And let's say they choose to not go full range of motion or they choose to not do something to the best of their ability. You react by saying nothing or you react by saying, this is the way we do it. We're holding the standard. And over time, that controls the input. And over time, that gets more predictable output. If I can get more predictable output, therefore, I'm going to have a probably a higher probability to assess the quality of my program. And this is a foundational piece of looking at how do I evaluate you? Because we can differ in philosophy, right? If we want to really substantiate that philosophy or ideology, we have to have control of the input. And we have to look at it from all the way to the top, right? What is that authority? What is that influence on technique? What is that actual presence when you're actually coaching? Can you describe demo and do? And if all of that's in place, let's say that you're stellar and you didn't reach results. It wasn't an execution or input problem. It was a philosophy problem. But if we don't have control on the input, your ability, we can never tell whether your actual philosophy or ideology was good or not because the input or the execution or reliability for looking at from research methods is not going to be there that we have no quality control on our environment. And very simply, when we start to think about, okay, well, how am I to evaluate you? I'm going to look at your session. I'm going to look at kids showing up on time or you starting on time. I'm going to look at kids actually respecting you in a way that I think has a positive reaction to the way you describe or demo or interact with your athletes. I'm going to look at you and the way you actually do the actual workout holding people to a standard and their reaction to it. Do they eye roll? Do they just not do it? Is it a lot of confrontation? A lot of times that's actually inconsistency on the coach part, right? If you are a rock in terms of consistency, over time, athletes will understand that this isn't a negotiation, that right. you're not just arbitrarily saying what's good or bad, that there is a right and wrong and you've developed that and your athletes respond to that. And the only thing I would ask for you is once you become absolute relentless pursuit of execution, technique, authority, and accountability, then you start to look at your program more objectively and saying, should we be reaching higher levels? And chances are, if you're executing really well on a bad program, you still get good results. Why not amplify that result by doing a really good program that's more appropriate for that situation or environment? And when we think about all that, we think about how am I evaluating you, thinking about your ability, your skill, this is often the big gap for a lot of strength conditioning coaches and people can talk a big game about what their program is or how effective what they do really is but the proof is always in the pudding and when we think about what a real coach is is do they have an influence right do we, when we watch a football game or on saturday in college football do we think that that was just by chance a team wins or not or is it better talent better preparation and the convergence off of better talent identification and recruiting, maybe you have more resources offside by that, but you still have to develop it. There's plenty of teams with a lot of talent that don't win. And when you think about that output of winning or losing based off the quality of talent identification, developing that talent, practicing at a high level, why wouldn't the same thing be attributed to strength and conditioning and what we're doing, right? Having the most, the brightest, the smartest, the most prepared people that are using high level sports science, analytics, objective data, 
And then once we use that data to make better decisions from a programming standpoint, from exercise selection or variable selection, and how we organize that and layer that, it will really come down no matter what into how well we actually execute our program. And if you can't, I don't want to hear it. I really don't, because that's the most important aspect, that we are only as good as the work we put in and the quality of that work makes a difference. And you could argue with me, it's semantics, it's a small influence, and why do it? That's the part that drives me nuts about strength coaches who diminish the value in what we're doing. So let's say that is 1% that has an influence on wins and losses. When you're shrinking the actual percentile that you're having influence, you turn it from 1% to 0.5% with poor technique, execution, accountability, and authority. You're just not making an influence with that 1%. So my 1% is going to be optimized. Yours is 0.5. I, I beg to differ. I don't think it is 1%. I think it's much greater, especially if you're really good. I think it compounds too. I think you have a bigger concentric circle into other things. How you do something is how you do everything. So if you're doing everything within the weight room to the best of your ability with precision and excellence and authority and accountability, you're probably going to have that carry over in the way you practice, the way you do film, the way you go to class. That some people are just going to have a bigger influence overall systemically than others. And that's the real value of a strength and conditioning coach. And that's what so much other support staff really just doesn't fully grasp. It's our sphere of influence is, is dramatic. It's profound if we're really good at understanding what we have to control. And just being consistent in the rock and the person that everyone in the athletic department can, can, department can depend on to get the job done. And so that's, it's audacious, it's big, but I'm just going to look at Reddit, your session, and I'm going to say, okay, well, let's break it down in those three variables. And then that last variable, can you demo, describe, and do? And I'm going to give you a objective feedback on that. Yes, you were good at demonstrating. Okay, your description was poor. You used a lot of filler words. You didn't look at your athletes when you talk, when you're describing the workout. You didn't have really powerful metaphors or analogies that those kids can relate to and understand. When you actually got on the floor, there were several athletes who skipped reps or missed reps or didn't do it with the best possible technique and you didn't say anything. These are objective points. And the more influence you have on that, and I could break it down too. If you want 100 kids, okay, well, you have 60 minutes, 100 kids. Okay, we're going to divide that 60 minutes by 100. That's how much time that you're going to spend with each athlete. It could be a minute. Did you get a minute with every single one of your athletes or 45 seconds? Did you get that time with them? Were you that active or kinetic during the actual workout? And yes or no. And that's what you're thinking about when you're actually objectively evaluating someone. And I think that part is as we start to look through strength conditioning as a whole, that should be the epicenter of everything that we do. I don't think that's a limiting factor. What I do think is, is a undeniable aspect. There's good strength conditioning coaches that dominate and control their space better than anyone else just because they're phenomenal what actually zero to 60 goes for that, that training session. You evaluated me. I'm weak in one of, or all three of those areas. What would be my next steps? What would you recommend to me to start making those improvements so that I can be a better coach and improve that ability? It comes down to two filters, education and training. Education is you don't know, and I need to educate you on what to know. Training is you do know, you just need refinement and improvement, right? And it's like the difference between the first time you do something in your, in your life, you need to be educated on basic understanding, right? The, what is the program? What's the set and rep? What's tempo? What's intensity? What's rest time? How to do an exercise? Why this exercise? These are all foundational things that we are gather. So education, in theory, for most strength education coaches who have a bachelor's degree and some sort of baseline certification of CSCS or CSCCA, should have a foundation of knowledge. Not always the case. And there's like several levels of specific knowledge to an environment, right? We do Olympic lifts, we do powerlifting, we do machines, we do speed, we do multi-directional speed, we do top end speed. We use these tools like sports science stuff with looking at vault or Hawkins or whatever else, right? Those are educational pieces that you just need to get people up to speed on because they might not have been exposed to that version of it or at all. But then there's training. And that comes after education. So you develop some sort of basic level comprehension of what you're doing. I got to evaluate whether it's a motivation problem. So if you're not motivated, do it correctly. Probably means I need to find someone else, to be completely honest. The next level goes into, all right, was it poor education, right? Were there holes or gaps in the educational process? Because we see this pattern redundantly, not just you, Corey, or across several other coaches that are work, working in that environment. 
they are consistently making the same mistakes probably means a gap within the education. And then the final aspect is just simply looking at it from discipline and holding a standard, right? We're asking our athletes to go through a full range of motion, maintain a certain position, have the right timing of certain exercises. Why not for a coach, right? Well, what is our actual execution? The fourth workout in a row, four straight hours, right? We just did a 6 a.m., a 7 a.m., an 8 a.m., and a 9 a.m. What's our level of execution? We probably know that program so well, like it's easy to just go through. But we might get lazy or we might be fatigued or we might not necessarily have the motivation to do it correctly. And that part could come into, okay, well, we need to utilize breaks. We need to rotate different coaches in. We need to keep it interesting by having coaches coach different stations or different racks. The other part is maybe it's just, hey, I'm not holding the standard as a leader, right? So you're looking to me for guidance and I'm inconsistent. And you don't value it because I don't value it. I don't have enough respect for myself to do it correctly. So therefore, why should you respect what I'm asking you to do? It's the same dynamic though we're asking our athletes, right? So for, in order for me to have some sort of influence on you to do things correctly, I have to be authoritative. I have to be consistent and reliable. I have to be able to describe demo and do, I got to be able to walk the walk. And then the other part is we talked about in the first part is if we're doing these things correctly, we should see some improvement and a pedigree of developing coaches and holding a standard and saying what needs to be said when it needs to be said is so important to get further with a new coach or someone that is not going to believe you up the street. And, you know, I got into this with a podcast I did last week is this idea that young people have changed. You're not. They're all self-serving. They're all looking at this for their own self-interest because it's everything they know into this point in their life. Why would they have any selfless thought? Their whole life has been centered on them. So to walk into a situation to be selfless, just intuitively, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But on the other note, what really has become important is you have to get honest and you have to become thorough with describing and being very upfront with, unless you're willing to change the way you think about this job, from being selfless and focusing on others over yourself, you're probably never going to make the change. And that starts with the person in front of you. That I'm, I care about you and your development as a coach because as one that has self-interest in myself so I can preserve my job or I can keep growing or I can keep providing a high quality service to our athletes or clients. But in the other note, that's the best way for you to grow. And when we think about the future of strength conditioning, we need better leaders to be more conscientious of the influence of what they're saying and what they're doing with their coaches. And then we need coaches to be more focused on them doing a better job. And it's looking at it from, man, usually in an interview, most people do their, put their best foot forward. But on the other end, most people in a situation that are getting evaluated are probably going to put the best version of them. And if that's not very good, you got to look at their average is probably significantly lower than and when I'm thinking about giving you feedback and it's low grade, knowing that's your best grade you could possibly get because you were being evaluated and watched probably means that you need to get better overall. And I need to do a double take whether I really set you up for success with my education system, my training, or am I being consistent enough as a, a leader or a coach? But that is really the simple thing is how we're evaluating your session is really how we want to evaluate our leadership. And it, it just has this fractal relationship that there's no difference between a evaluating another coach versus the quality of your session. If you really think about it. Really? I mean, if we're going to boil it down, whether you're developing young coaches or you are that young coach looking to help athletes, it's just boiled down to consistency of reps. Yeah. And yeah, no doubt. I think that's the part people take for granted is you get better at it. The more you do it. Mm -hmm. And that should encourage you to do it more. Yeah. Public speaking is not innate. No matter what anyone wants to say, getting up in front of someone is not comfortable or easy. The more you do it, the better you get at it. I've seen the most introverted, quiet, reserved people become phenomenal at coaching because they're just repped it. Mm -hmm. I've seen the most extroverted people decline as a coach because they never did the, it was easy early and they never repped it as much as they possibly should. And they didn't take reps with, a diver high diversity, right? The coach that only worked with football and then 
got fired, has to take another job, maybe take on some other sports. They are so out of their depth working with other Olympic sports from doing a different style of programming or potentially just communicating with athletes that aren't football athletes. And that part becomes, okay, this is a clear representation of this person just simply doesn't have a lot of diversity of reps within their arsenal to be as well-rounded of a coach as it could possibly be. And therefore that should say, put the work in, learn how to write a program for golf. Now learn how to demonstrate the movements that you're doing in golf and not just defaulting to the movements that you would do with what you did with football and become more competent in communicating to those athletes and understanding the sport and the dynamic and what happens. Learn the lingo, learn the dynamic, show them you care. And that process is so empowering for the people that are really motivated. And it gets back into that motivation, right? We're just going to talk about knowledge next week, but the notion that the motivation is the thing that's going to really allow you to take that feedback or not. And if you are maybe not as prone to improve, you're probably going to be limited to serve the athletes the level that you should. This has been great, Tim. Uh, a lot of good talks. You're killing it. Excellent rant, by the way. You nailed it. Yeah. Thank you. Very uh, this was great. I appreciate it, Tim. Awesome, man. Bye, buddy. All right.